Chapter 9 continued, continued. Tonight we're having chili con carne, spouted their salivatory host, his guests once again sitting ducks at the table. No, not your typical Scottish fare. But this time they had the privilege of eating in the fancy dining room rather than the kitchen as they usually did. The lighting was dim. The candles lit, the table long and extravagantly set, and the tall upholstered chairs comfy. That sounds lovely, Melody spoke, picking up a squeegee she'd brought down from the shower room and dragging it across her spattered lenses. For the love of all that is senile, Mel, what happened to your tooth? probed Dad, not quite so surprised. A muffled sound coming from Tarzan interrupted them. What's that, Tar? Dad turned his head towards the boy. Tarzan flipped open the visor on the heavy-duty welding mask he'd just been speaking from deep within. Can I borrow that next, please, Mel? He repeated, much more clearly now. Melody handed him her squeegee. Flipping the visor back down with a smooth snap, Tar began running the squeegee across its opaque viewing port. Everyone had dreaded facing old Kruger's spittle barrage at mealtimes, so they'd spent some time rummaging around the house looking to equip themselves suitably beforehand. Tar had found his welding mask downstairs in the basement. Hubert intervened on his sister's behalf. Sorry, Dad, he apologized, twirling a gaudy umbrella over his shoulder. I accidentally bumped into her this morning. It really hurt my head. <laughs> Chef Kruger was next to interrupt, going around the table, wheeling a rickety old serving trolley, boasting a large steaming pot of chili. How much would you like for your first serving, Master Hubert? Two ladles to start? Hugo instantly brought his brawly into defense position, twirling it between them, deflecting the flying spatui. Uh, yes, please, I guess. Did you have a nice time this afternoon, Daddy? <laughs> Mel politely asked out of interest. Why, yes, I did, thank you, sweetheart, Dad replied. I had a nice drink and a chat with the monk Moses and Kruger here. And a woman named Marjorie joined us as well. Hugo signaled Tar under the table with his foot while making grotesque gestures with his face, hoping to make Tar burst out laughing and embarrass himself. I know you've met Moses before, Dad continued. I believe you've also met Marjorie? Melody responded in the affirmative, while Tarzan attempted to discreetly broadcast his nonsense back across the table to Hugo. Well, that's good. Anyway, we only have a few more days left before we head back home. It's apparent you're all enjoying yourselves immensely, and I'm sure you'll continue to do so. Just do try to look after each other, Dad implored. Kruger had joined them in their special dining experience, sitting down and digging into a bowl of chili beans. Decorating the conversation in his own liquefied manner, moist lips dripped with unnecessary and distracting excess. Remnants of bean and corn spewed forth from Kruger's lips and teeth with every t and p and st and ch. Red tomato and brown sauce hailed forth across the table, spattering innocent by-sitters. Tar and Mel passed the squeegee back and forth between the two of them, wiping lenses, scraping faceplate, Hugo brandishing his umbrella shield with attentive skill. The children decided to join in on the assault. Tar went first, flipping open his helmet. Hey, Hugo, chew your food! A particle of Tar's meal sailed over to Hugo's bowl before he could react. Pardon me, he spat back. A bit of celery launched straight for Tar's head. Tar was on it, flipping his visor back down in time. Sploink landed the morsel right on his faceplate. Flipping it immediately back up, he returned fire. Don't you care about eating properly? I always eat properly. You're the one who can't keep his food to himself. 
Bits of chili flew brazenly back and forth between the two assailants. Melody was forced to man the squeegee across her glasses a few more times. Kruger flinched a little, too, accidentally and literally tasting a bit of his own medicine, samples of the boys' meals ending up on the side of his head and in his offending orifice. Still, he continued to talk and to spout and to share his stories and spittle and food with the others around the table. Against a strategically placed kraut manning a rattling machine gun, the Brits didn't stand a chance, hunkering down in their narrow trenches. The young ones, incapable of communicating their distress in a mature manner, carried on with their punctuating warfare against each other. Perhaps the children's perspectives were a bit exaggerated, but Dad was either being far too polite with their host, or he was as oblivious as a shower cap in the wash during rinse cycle. How can he not know? Does he not see what is going on? Can he not feel the soggy projectiles landing on his face? <laughs> is he not aware of the plight of his children before him? Dad finished his dinner wholeheartedly thanking Kruger for a most delicious meal, absent-mindedly wiping a mysterious fleck from off his cheek. Grown-ups. Since both Huey and Mel had been through somewhat of a tough day, what with the broken tooth and the outhouse incident, they all agreed to call it an early night. Even Tarzan's mind was too preoccupied with his conversation he'd had with Mel during their long walk through the heather to bother doing anything crazy tonight. Night nights were issued all around, and everyone went straight to their respective bedchambers. Once in bed, Melody said a little prayer for her family and for her friend Tar and the few nice people she'd met on the island before drifting off. Hugo, snugly fitted into a tight pair of plaid pajamas, threw his soiled clothes into the top drawer of a dresser. Upon closing the drawer, he heard a faint click from within. Puzzled, he reopened the drawer to find his clothes had disappeared. That's strange. Feeling inside with his hand, he noticed a gap. Must be a false bottom. Upon inspiration, he pulled out all the drawers as far as they could go, one on top of the other. He was right. All of the drawers had lost their bottoms, leaving a large area for a boy to step into. At the very bottom lay his rank clothes. Ignoring his clothes, he climbed right inside the stacked drawers. Squatting down, he then pushed on the backs of the drawers and, sure enough, they easily moved aside as one, opening up to an unknown crawl space behind the dresser and in through the wall. Magic, he thought to himself. Guess we'll just have to see where this goes. Hugo crawled along on hands and knees in the dark, using his head as a feeler. After a few moments, he bumped into a wall, forcing him to turn a corner. Moving right, he shuffled along, chubby knees getting more and more bruised. Not much later, he came to an abrupt end. Where am I? Groping around in the dark, he felt a small knob by his left shoulder. Grabbing hold and pushing it to one side, a small panel slid open. Tarzan, headboard against the wall, lay in bed staring up to the ceiling, thinking about home. He was in no hurry to get back to his mother. Family life for him wasn't all to be desired. He envied Mel and that she had a loving family. And he admired her simple belief in God. I wish I could be happy like Melody. I wish I knew everything would be all right. In a moment of divine inspiration, he spoke aloud. God, if you are real, I pray you would reveal yourself to me. Just then, Hugo's head poked out beside him from a panel in the headboard. Yes, my son, <laughs> Hugo replied with a deeply pious voice directly into Tar's ear. Tarzan couldn't help his reflexes. His right hand flew up and bopped God square on the nose. <laughs> Ow, said the Lord. <laughs> Tarzan sat up in bed. <laughs> Jesus, but Django, what the heck? You scared me, he reacted somewhat embarrassed for having been caught praying out loud. Then, 
seeing his friend's neck sticking through an opening at the head of his bed. Uh, are you stuck? Nah, but I don't think I can get all the way through. I'm in this small passageway that leads back to my room. Maybe this is just a secret compartment for passing along contraband items, suggested Hugo. Or for spying, thought Tarzan more accurately. Or for doing pranks. Bet you could play some awesome pranks with this. If I'd known about this before, I would have rubbed your face with mayonnaise in your sleep, or put a frog on your pillow, or... Or given a wet willy, Tar joined, or tickled your face with the toilet brush, or... Or shoved used earplugs up your nose, or... Or whispered subliminal messages into your dreams, Tarzan one-upped him. You were falling down a deep, deep shaft, never to stop. Down, down, down you are falling, never to reach the bottom. The feeling in your tummy is horrible. When will it ever stop, you plead? Never. Sucks to be you. <laughs> Hugo stayed where he was, body parked out in the compartment in the wall, head resting on Tar's plump pillow, the two of them enjoying unexpected late-night sniggering. They shared crude jokes chatted away about the fun they'd had so far on the island, things they missed back home, and goofy memories they shared from school. On into the night they lay together, heads side by side, enjoying companionship as good childhood chums, until they got so tired they fell asleep without realizing. Unbeknownst to either of them, Hugo would gift Tarzan with a gigantic puddle of drool on his pillow right next to his cheek, which Tar was bound to roll into upon waking up. Nice.